Thank you. Thank you. Item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 15040 in the name of Jane Baxter on Fairer Fife Commission Report, Fairness Matters. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I now call on Jane Baxter to speak and to open the debate. You have seven minutes or thereby, please, Ms Baxter. Thank you. I'd like to begin by congratulating Fife Partnership for what I believe was a bold decision to set up the Fair of Fife Commission. The Commission was set up as an independent body with a membership from across the public, private and third sector, with support by a secretariat comprising officers from the Council and from Carnegie UK Trust. I welcome that this Commission was established to provide a strategic overview of the scale, scope and nature of poverty in Fife and the effectiveness of activity currently undertaken to address such poverty. The Commission was asked to report to Fife Council and Fife Partnership by November 2015 and my motion seeks to acknowledge the significant contribution that I believe this report will make to the ongoing efforts to reduce inequality in Fife. And I want to thank all those individual commissioners from the public, private and third sector who gave up their time and energy to fulfil the brief set out by Fife Partnership. The report is enriched by the evidence from a wide range of witnesses and the testimonies of community organisations across Fife. Thus, we have a report which combines data with lived experience, and this, I believe, makes the recommendations all the more powerful. I attended the launch of the report at the Cottage Family Centre in Kirkcaldy last November. That's a centre which was originally developed by a group of local parents and established in 1987. Its purpose is to provide a family centre serving Kirkcaldy, which caters for the needs of families with preschool children. The Cottage Family Centre adopts a community development approach that puts the needs and aspirations of families and children at the centre of its service development and delivery, and it encourages their participation in the management and development of the centre. The centre embodies the ethos and culture called for in the report, and along with six other organisations, it hosted visits by the Commission and supported their service users to give personal testimonies to inform the Commission's work. Now, it's true to say that fairness is a broad umbrella, which encompasses of subjective and objective concepts. Fairness can mean different things to different people. The Commission defined a fair of Fife as a Fife where all residents have the capability to live good lives, make choices and reach their full potential, and where all children are safe, healthy and happy. I believe that poverty and inequality is a huge barrier to Fife achieving that vision, but I also believe that poverty and inequality are not inevitable. They are created by the collective actions of society and can be reduced by that same process. And the Commission's own analysis states that ever-widening inequality is neither natural or intractable. And as such, it's important to recognise the scope and ambition of the Fair of Five Commission report in addressing this important issue. Fairness Matters may be a report specific to Fife. However, the messages within it are pertinent to all areas in Scotland and will resonate with many. Indeed, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development is a strong advocate of the argument that inequality is both a moral issue and a severe drag on the economic performance of a society. I believe that this report, while concerning Fife, does have value across Scotland, for it provides a route map for new ways that the public, private and third sector organisations can work alongside communities to reduce inequality. I would like to, at this point to highlight that the report does recognise the work Fife has been doing to tackle these issues. And it states that there is no doubt that Fife has hugely capable, knowledgeable and committed people working in all sectors. But Fife, along with all communities across Scotland, has no room for complacency, especially with the hard financial choices now facing councils in Scotland. So we must ensure that resources are targeted in order to develop person-centred and sustainable solutions. This will require more partnership working, co-location of services and a willingness to reach out to where people are rather than expecting them to come to us. So I'm heartened to see that the Commission's report, approach to tackling poverty and inequality is truly citizen-focused, putting community at its centre. This inclusive approach can result in evidence that leads to solutions, rather than simply recognising the scale of the problem. It's the difference between data and knowledge, and more knowledge leads to better decisions. The report includes recommendations which reflect this local perspective. For example, why not replicate the principles of the city deal concept with a five towns deal, with support provided to local geographies? 
or a free travel card for those seeking work or recently gaining employment, or a non-commercial tariff for broadband to be made available for social housing tenants. The report includes numerous such recommendations, which are rooted in local people's lived experiences. The challenge will be to make them happen, to develop a why not culture and release the latent energy in organisations and communities. I believe, and I have seen for myself through my work and political experience, that putting communities at the heart of decision making hugely increases the quality of decisions made and the likelihood of them having a positive impact. I am therefore confident that the report's recommendations, of which there are 40, gathered into eight groups ambitious, poverty free, fair work, affordable, connected, empowered, skilled, and healthier, are relevant. They have realistic timescales and targets, and they have outcomes which will lead to reduced levels of poverty and inequality. The big message for me coming out of this report is the emphasis on maintaining a citizen focus, working together, being ambitious, and achieving improved long-term outcomes for people, not just improvements in process or inputs. When the action plan that follows the recommendations of this report is published, I'm sure that strategic partners will work together alongside communities to ensure that a beneficial change is made. Moving forward, I'm pleased to see that the initial focus will be supporting new ways of working and attempting to drive the cultural shift that will be necessary to create the fairer Fife to which the report aspires. I hope that Fife Partnership fully explores the more innovative recommendations. Further to this, community action will be at the heart of making real change. So I welcome the report's assertion that top-down and post-change will no longer be effective. Fife Council and the Community Planning Partnership have an important leadership and convening role, but change requires action from everyone living, employing, doing business and working in Fife. I hope that this report will start a conversation in Fife, a conversation between all sectors of our community, and inspire a real drive for change led for and delivered by the community. The Fair of Fife Commission report is trying to tackle an extremely serious matter in our society. We as a parliament must welcome any attempts to address this problem, and further, we must also take serious consideration of all recommendations to lessen what is a great unfairness in our country. I'm pleased that this motion has been recognised with cross-party support, as, as it is only by working together to address the real concerns affecting people's daily lives that we can build a better future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Rod Campbell to be followed by Alec Rowley. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, first of all, can I apologise to the Chamber? I will not be able to stay for the debate after my contribution and to another engagement. But can I congratulate Jane Baxter on bringing uh, this debate to the Chamber today? And I welcome the opportunity to speak very briefly on the Five Fairness Commission's report. Since the Commission was established in September 2014, it's progressed toward, towards its remit to take a strategic overview of the scale, scope and nature of poverty in Fife and the effectiveness of activity currently undertaken to address such poverty. Tackling deprivation is a strategy that ought to be close to all of our hearts and one that I'm sure members will agree is fundamental in achieving a better world for everyone, especially young people. I commend the people who make up the Commission who have given time as volunteers in the creation of the work of the Commission for the benefit of others. Martin Evans, the Chair of the Fair of Fife Commission and CEO of the Carnegie UK Trust, said in its introduction, our report has been enhanced, enriched by those taking the time to contribute their thoughts and experience. And that's undoubtedly correct. And he particularly welcomed and expressed his gratitude to the looked after children from Fife, who, supported by the Scottish Children's Parliament, spent the morning uh, with him and provided an outstanding evidence on what is important for all children. The view expressed was that all children should be safe, happy and healthy. And that's undoubtedly the case. And can I also commend the contribution of the Chief Executive of Fife Council, Steve Grimmond, who I believe has given valuable advice and support throughout. Looking at the report itself, um, the introduction obviously makes uh, the important comment that the issues of fairness, poverty and participation are at the top of the political agenda in Scotland and indeed in many other countries. Um, one of the great problems today is that in many Western countries, the gap between the rich and poor, far from narrowing, is getting wider. But as the report makes clear, there is no universally accepted definition of fairness. What's clear, however, from the report is that 
Unfairness exists when inequalities are allowed to interrelate and compound, which results in those experiencing disadvantage in one area of their lives, too often experiencing disadvantage in others. So in our society, income and wealth inequality is strongly connected with inequalities in education, health, housing and our environment. And that's undoubtedly true. And indeed, I just also wanted to highlight the, um, the evidence, the view of the OECD, it, it, who in a, a recent report advocated the argument that inequality is both a moral issue and a severe drag on the economic performance of a society. Uh, I think it's undoubtedly the case that if we tackle inequality, we're more likely to have a, a growing economy. So it, it should be a win-win situation. Looking at the recommendations themselves, I just wanted to highlight um, recommendations, in particular the section headed Fair Work, which involves not only recommendations in relation to the, the, the aim of making Fife a living wage region, but also a recommendation to explore fairness in self-employment with a view to encouraging self-employed workers to structure their work and enterprise arrangements to maximise their earnings and work security. In my view, self-employees are particularly at the risk of economic downturns, of recession, and of poor health, physical or mental. So I particularly welcome this recommendation in the report. Jane Baxter has talked about the number of recommendations. There are too many to go through in detail. But one other one I thought was relevant is the, the recommendation to refocus the geography of economic development activity from a Fife outwards view to one that looks at the assets within Fife and to support towns to attract good jobs to Fife. This is an important debate. I, I, I welcome the opportunity to make that modest contribution, and I thank Jane Baxter once again for bringing the debate to the Chamber. Many thanks. I now call on Alec Rowley, after which we'll move the closing speech from the Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. I also would uh, thank Jane Baxter, congratulate Jane Baxter, for bringing this debate to Parliament today. The Fife Fairer Fife Commission was an important um, step in the right direction in terms of looking at how we tackle inequality and poverty in Fife. And I congratulate those who served on that commission and indeed the report that, that they brought forward. It is important, however, that we then start to look at these recommendations, all 40 of those recommendations. And it's important that the partners in Fife who set the commission up now start to set out the detail of how they intend to see these recommendations actually put um, into, into action. And they start to set out in that programme a timescale and actions that need to be taken and by whom. Because whilst the Fife Partnership, I did have the, the, um, the pleasure to chair the Fife Partnership over a period of time, um, it was not always clear, as I would say, for community planning more generally, what each partner brought to the table um, and what their role actually was. And I think that's something that, and it's not a criticism of the government because I know the government's committed to community planning, as I am, I, I am also committed to community planning. But I think we actually need to start to actually get much clearer outcomes and much clearer information of who's actually responsible for what, what is it they're going to deliver and how all that comes together. And an example in terms of one of the, one of the recommendations in here around the living wage, um, clearly employers have a large part to play in delivering the living wage, as they do in terms of apprenticeships. But I was never convinced of the role of employers at the table in terms of the five partnership and who actually represented them. Indeed, I would say the same about the third sector. I was never convinced that the body that came from the third sector actually represented all third sector organisations in five. So I think there is, whilst in the right direction, there is a lot more work to do there. But you know, if we go back to the first half of the last century, and the beverage report and the five evils that beverage talked about want squalor idleness ignorance and disease he set out a clear agenda at that time of why we had to tackle these five giant evils within society. And the reality is, in one shape or form or another, these five evils are very much with us in Fife and across Scotland today. And the fact that there are 75,000 people in Fife living in poverty, indeed, Poverty in Fife, you would say in absolute terms, has grown over this last, this last um, decade. 
um, well, certainly this, this last um, five, six, seven years, and we see with the welfare reforms that are taking place just now. And the evidence of that is that we have food banks. And absolute poverty can be defined where people are not able to actually access what you would describe as the very basics in order to survive. And I would suggest that being able to eat, being able to feed your kids is the very basics in our society that people need to be able to survive. And so the growth of food banks and food banks in Mon constituency and Cross Hill and Cowan Beath and Rasyth and Inverkeaton, the growth of food banks right across Fife and right across Scotland is the absolute evidence that absolute poverty is there in communities across Scotland. And we need to work out how we're actually going to tackle that. If I could pick up, as, as Roderick Campbell said, there's a lot of recommendations here, all worthy, and we need to see a programme of how they're going to be implemented. But if you take credit unions, for example, I myself am a member of the Dunfermline and District Credit Union, and they have a branch up in Kelty um, that, that I save and borrow with. But we need to see the development of credit unions, not just for poor people, but for the whole community. And there's more that needs to be done there, more, I believe, that the local authority can actually do. So it's nice words to say that we need to grow credit unions and grow them into, into employers, and I agree with that, and part of the partnership should be about that. But we need to set a clear strategy, a measurable strategy with measurable outcomes about how we're actually going to grow credit unions across communities. One of the most successful community credit unions in Scotland is a small credit union up in Blingery in Benarty, the Benarty Credit Union, and it sits now with assets in millions of pounds, and it has helped thousands of people in those communities over the years. It is a massive success story. So, you know, again, there are lessons that to be learnt there, but the key point for me is I very much welcome this report. I welcome the work that has been done, but I do say that all the partners now need to look at this, set out clearly how these recommendations can be taken forward, how they can be achieved, how they will measure that, and who, more importantly, is actually going to do what to try and achieve that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Riley. I now call on the Minister to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes or thereby, please, Minister. Mark. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you for the chance to come here. Uh, thanks to Jane Baxter for this uh, motion on the Fairer Fife Commission. This has been really quite fascinating for me as local government minister uh, because it is a wonderful example of a local authority leading a partnership approach and really reconnecting with some of the spirit of um, even before Beveridge when very often across Scotland it was our local authorities that were the pioneers, the experimenters that were at the forefront before national government had caught up fully with the need to deal with inequality. The term municipal socialism uh, was very fashionable in the early 20th century but that sense of uh, local authorities as champions for their areas to advance well-being, to identify the ills in their local areas is a really important one. The Fair of Fife Commission's work is remarkable in a, a number of ways. I, I, I have noted the division of the work into the four themes of paid and unpaid workplace, being well, uh, life courses and transitions, but how that has produced a, a great piece of work. Now, more of that in a moment. The Commission certainly has an impressive lineup. It has a series of people of distinguished background coming from a variety of different backgrounds as well. Uh, I know one, John, uh, Jim McCormick, who sat with me on the uh, Commission on Local Tax Reform and made a great contribution. But just like that Commission, it's not all in the people on the Commission. The Commission itself is more important than that. It is about the way of working that has been talked about, that participative approach. I have been fascinated both in my own work through the Commission on Local Tax Reform, what I've seen from Fairer Scotland and what I've seen here in uh, the Fife uh, Commission, about the sheer effect that having the personal face-to-face -face contact with the people who have to live these problems every day that you're trying to solve can have. To sit around a table, to have people who are, as this Commission did, looked after children, the users of food banks or people who have experienced sanctions, to tell that story does mean the difference between, as Jane Baxter very, very eloquently put it, knowledge and data. You get the understanding of what the 
the real experience is with far greater colour than you would otherwise. And those colours are very often very stark ones. But it is remarkable and you see it in the recommendations that have come out, that the people who are facing these challenges are not short of ideas for how to fix them. They're not short of what needs to be done. And the approach that has been quite common to public policy for, for many decades now of putting experts in a room and having them come up with the idea, uh, ideas for what to do on their own is seeing its day and uh, this kind of approach where government does things with people rather than to people has a lot to commend it. Another thing that Jane Baxter said that I thought summed it up very nicely was the idea of developing a why not culture. So that instead of these ideas sitting there and being felt uh, to be uh, impossible and people thinking well what can I do with that no one will pay me any attention to think well you know, if, I, if, we want to, uh, if we want to have a social enterprise capacity in Business Gateway that's greater, why not? Why, why not? If we want to join up services so that, uh, to look at one of the other recommendations that NHS staff provide a bit of information on income maximisation, then why not? We have to look at these, take these ideas and run with them. One of the great, <coughs> one of the great pieces of, one of the, the the things I have been constantly trying to do as I have gone around the country as the Community Empowerment Minister speaking to CPPs in particular has been to emphasise this message of participation. That participation, bringing people in, getting them to give their ideas is very different to the old style consultation. You can't do it for everything, but for the core issue of equality and inequality in this country, the people that we're trying to help should be the people in the driving seat of the, the action that is being taken. And the only way to empower the disempowered is by showing faith in them, by having these conversations, by taking them seriously, but then also <clears throat> showing the action that is going to come from it, because there is nothing that is going to compound cynicism more than bringing people in, listening to them, and then going away and not acting on what they say or doing something else entirely. And that is a, a circle that we have to close in all of our public sector activity to make sure uh, that we keep the faith with the, the public here. Now, Alex Rowley mentioned some of the issues with community planning partnerships, and I have to accept that I would I agree with him on some of the areas where community planning partnerships do need to, to step up their work. I have sometimes uh, referenced somewhat frivolously the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the uh, somebody else's problem was recognised uh, as, uh, as a thing that could make anything invisible, even if that is a flying sofa across Lords. If it's not your problem, you just don't see it. And wherever I go, Whenever I bang the drum for community empowerment and public service reform, I say that somebody else's problem is a phrase that should be banned. The community planning partnerships exist to bring the, all the people around the table so that the priorities can be isolated and the problems that can't be solved by anyone alone can be solved together. And making sure that there is buy-in is some of the uh, thinking behind the provisions in the Community Empowerment Act, but I think we'll need some further work in the next, uh, in the next parliament, probably building on that act. As Alex Rowley said, perhaps the key is making sure that we have very strong employer business representation around the table and that all third sector organisations can feed in because there's a very big difference between the big third sector providers that will work fife wide and for example a small neighbourhood association in a deprived area and they both have really important things to bring to the table. So I would just conclude by saying that this is a model of good work, it's a model of combining the different public sector players, the voluntary sector players, expertise and public participation. I would commend it. I do not envy the people who have to take these recommendations and turn them into an action plan because it is so ambitious. But I would, I would commend this work and I would recommend to any other council thinking about whether they should do something likewise to do so. Many thanks and thank you all. I now close this meeting of Parliament.